You're listening to Why We Do What We Do. Welcome to Why We Do What We Do. I am your detectably nervous host, Abraham. And I am your covered in nodes, Shane? Yeah, you are covered sure. in nodes. That's a fact. <laughs> We're a psychology <laughs> podcast. We talk about all the things that people do and sometimes how we measure the things that they do. And then sometimes what we do is we take a step back and we replay an oldie and a golden oldie from the beginnings of this, the humble beginnings of this podcast several years ago, because maybe you're new and you haven't heard us before. Or maybe you're around and you don't remember us talking about this thing. But, uh, but we call these our nostalgia episodes, just opening one of these up and playing it back for you to, to recapture the good old days. Yeah, it's kind of like turning on the radio and listening to the Beach Boys instead of Nickelback. <laughs> A good choice for anybody in all circumstances. Yes. <laughs> if those are your two choices, I yeah, guess. I guess, yeah. Uh, anyway, back when we were publishing these, we did not acknowledge the day on which the episode was published, and now we do. And even if we had acknowledged it back in the day, it wouldn't be true for a nostalgia release. So this episode will be published July 5th, so happy post-Independence Day. Hopefully Yay! you are rid of your fireworks and are not setting forests on fire. And observed all laws around you with respect to that yes or just shot fireworks at each other if that's your choice i guess i mean I, i'm from florida and that's that's a pastime of ours that is fair firing roman candles at each other yeah that is true <laughs> but anyway because this comes out july 5th there are some actual holidays to acknowledge in july 5th and one of them is that it is national bikini day so guys and gals go get your bikinis on yeah, I got mine. It's National Hawaii Day as well, so welcome welcome to the Union. I'm sure you all are very stoked. I imagine the local culture is really thrilled. Yeah, those two go hand in hand a little bit. Yeah, a little bit, yeah. We have Mechanical Pencil Day. I love mechanical pencils. A good good point five lead for me. That's, that's yeah. the choice stuff. Me too. Me too. Yep. Yeah. Alignment, my friend. Alignment. It's also National Apple Turnover Day, so I'm a big fan of desserts, so Yum. I like that. It's National Graham Crackers Day, and there's actually some fun history to dig in on Graham Crackers because the history of the Graham Cracker is weird. <laughs> I think we actually talked about this, <laughs> believe it or not, in our masturbation episode. <laughs> yes, we did, because cornflakes have a similar history. Okay, yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Kellogg is the guy. Yeah, yeah. You can go find out more about uh, Graham Crackers by listening to our discussion on <laughs> masturbation. Yes, yes, you can. It's also National Ian Day, so if your name is Ian, I guess congratulations, you have a whole day. That's a thing? Yeah, it, okay. it was very much so a thing. I was surprised myself. It is National Workaholics Day, I guess. Stop it? Yeah, <laughs> is that don't how do I that. respond to that, maybe? Yeah, don't do that anymore. It's National Pet Remembrance Day. I have a, a giant remembrance tattoo on my forearm for a pet of mine, so I appreciate this day. Nice. It is also Venezuela and Algeria Independence Days. Happy Independence Days, guys. Yeah, congratulations, y'all. That's fun. In addition, we'll acknowledge that July is National Cell Phone Courtesy Month. And this has to do with uh, bone up on your cell phone etiquette and do your part to make society less annoying. Which is to, like, don't use speakerphone when you're in public. Yeah. Maybe or ever. consider who's, who's around you. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah or ever, yeah. Yeah. Or so, stop using your phone as a walkie-talkie. Do you remember those days? Do you remember <laughs> when that was a thing that was going on? I do. I do remember that being a thing. Yeah. That was a very specific moment in time. It's like that and, like, hit clips. Like, we're very specific things. I don't remember hip, cl hip clips. Is that what you said? Hit clips. So they were, like, songs. Oh. On, they were, like, these, like, like keychains. That was like one song okay. that you would put in this little device and it would play some like pop song and that was it. But you would have to pay for it. Like it was like, oh, wow. Basically, like it was like a device that would play one MP3 at a time. So it was like, like the, the iPod shuffle, except it only had like one track on it. Yeah. And you would have to change out. It was like, it was like having a tape for one song in this little thing. It was terrible. That's hilarious. Oh my yeah. gosh. Everybody thought the future was going to be so cool. <laughs> I mean, it's better than hit clips, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. there's that. For sure. We're actually not talking about hit clips today. We're talking about a, we're rerunning an old episode about the polygraph or lie detector test, how this is applied to forensic psychology, understanding of the psychological processes and how it's supposed to work. And this is from back in the day when it was just me and Ryan recording together. So Shane wasn't, it was not yet. I wasn't even born yet. 
you weren't even born yet. You're you're <laughs> just a hypothesis at that point. Uh-huh. This was episode 29, published November 30th, 2017. We're going to go ahead and just play the episode in its entirety here, and then we're going to come back at the end of this episode with some updates and discussion of what has happened in polygraphs since this episode was recorded in 2017. Anything to add before we jump into this, Shane? Nope. We'll see you in a minute. All right. Enjoy this episode on polygraphs. Hello, this is Abraham. And your co-host, Ryan O. And so today we are going to start by telling a little bit of a story. Okay. Let's hear it. Ready for a story? Yeah. Okay. All right. So there was this case where a woman had died. And before she had died, she had had an altercation. She had a fight with her ex-boyfriend. And so naturally, he became a leading suspect. It seems, you know, like that makes perfect sense that they had been in a relationship. They knew one another. They got in a fight and then she was found dead. Okay. And murdered nonetheless, not just, you know, dead. So as the leading suspect, he was offered, quote unquote, offered yeah. to take this polygraph lie detector test. And when he took it, he failed it, indicating that he was lying about what he was saying. Okay. Uh, however, in court, the remaining evidence about whether or not he had been the one who had committed this crime was insufficient to convict him. But because of this incident with the polygraph, his friends and his family really just wanted nothing to do with him. They were, you know, they were angry at him. They believed that he had lied and sort of tricked the system, that he was, in fact, guilty. And what was interesting is later they found the actual killer and they had the evidence to convict him of the crime. But this guy, his life at that point had already been ruined. And it was because of this um, failed polygraph test in this particular situation. It's rough. Yeah. Super rough. Not a great day for that guy. Although I'm sure this took place over the course of a year or two, at least. Now, we've already talked about lying in a previous episode. And one thing that we had brought up in that episode is how do you know when someone's lying? Like, is it that thing where you look up into the left or something that's supposed to be (laughs) you're accessing the creative part of your brain? Yeah. Is it something that we can measure? And spoiler alert, mostly we can't. But this particular story about the polygraph is one experiment in an attempt to try and measure lying where and if it occurs, okay? So as I already said, the polygraph is a quote-unquote lie detector test, all right? And it's primarily predicated on this idea that when people lie, they experience emotional distress about their lying and that these emotions have physiological correlates with them. Well, this is a pretty key thing here. Yeah, exactly. So basically the idea is that if I'm lying, then my heart rate's going to increase and I might sweat a little bit and I'm going to be nervous about the fact that I'm lying, maybe because I'm afraid of being caught or just because it's distressful for lying. Yeah. You also have elevated breathing that happens. Yeah. And blood pressure is supposed to increase. I think the one that we can all relate to probably at some point is the increased heart rate as well. Yeah. I like mean, that's something you can really feel really easily. Sure. Now. As we mentioned, lying, there's a lot of considerations around what that even is, because if you're withholding the truth, is that lying? If you are misleading someone, is that lying? Is it possible that you know that you're lying, but it doesn't cause you any emotional distress because there could be a lot of reasons, self-preservation, or you feel you're doing something in the best interest of someone else, or there could be a lot of reasons that you might be lying. And Let's go another route on this. What are some circumstances under which you might also have perspiration, elevated breathing, increased heart rate, and increased blood pressure? I mean, the one that I think of the most is like, what if you're wearing like a big heavy suit that day that you like yeah. set in to do this, right? Right. And the AC is broken. Like all of a sudden I'm going to be perspirating a lot. Now they like, we'll get into it. They have some control measures. Yeah. But there's a they lot do. of variables external to just the way that things typically set up. People might have a similar experience when they're about to perform, if they're going to present something in front of a group of people. Yep. Speaking is one of them. If you have anything personal going on in your life, that like stress Mm -hmm. can easily be triggered by just about anything, right? Totally. This could be a similar experience if you're really excited about something. Um, You just walked in and surprise birthday party and all your friends are there. You know, a lot of this increased arousal generally is what happens. And I know they're used a lot when we're talking about different jobs, right? Yeah. So in the context of a lot of government jobs, I guess, or not a lot, but in the context of some government jobs like the NSA, they are used there reportedly to the extent to which I don't know exactly. Mm -hmm. But yeah, if you're like super into this job that you're looking forward to, like I've been in that position where you're just like 
emotions are everywhere, right? Yeah. When you're in the actual interview. Yeah. Oh yeah. High stakes. You really want to get the job. You are going to have this, you know, the sweating and you're breathing hard and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Sometimes it's things you've prepared for, for like half your life. Yeah. And that's the day, you know? Right. So totally. And one other one I always think is fun is that this can happen in the throes of passion. If you're with someone that you care about, <laughs> you might be experiencing some of this as well. Throes of passion. Yep. <laughs> that's the way I'm putting it. Okay. All right. So how this machine actually works, they're mostly um, on computers anymore. They're software programs. It used to be this totally analog device that had all these needles that would like scribble back and forth on a piece of paper, but they still use the same kind of sensors. And what they are is there's this blood pressure cuff that just fits around the upper arm. And that's going to check for both your pulse and your blood pressure. There are these, what are called galvanometers, and those go on your finger. The wear or on your galvanometers. Finger. Galvanometers. I like that. I, that's would, probably I would bet it's that. So they fit on your finger and they indirectly measure skin conductance as an indirect measure associated with perspiration on the fingers. It goes on your first and third finger for some reason. Okay. Uh, hmm. I wonder why. Maybe it's, I'm not sure. That's what I, I found through some of my research. Oh, huh, I didn't but know that. I don't okay. know if that's consistent. Yeah, that's okay. They also have this thing called a pneumonograph, and this is a little coil that fits around your chest, and it actually works a little bit like an accordion where as you breathe, it will open up the passage and then will constrict the passage as your chest goes in and out. And what that does is those compressions are then converted into electrical signals, and those are measured in terms of your rate of breathing. And so basically you can see all of these measures of your of the skin galvanation and your lungs and how quickly you're breathing. All of those things can have these small changes in them that might be difficult to detect if you were just looking at someone, but if you have the sensitive equipment, could uh, really powerfully detect those changes that are going on in on your body. And this is really measuring the activity of what's called the sympathetic or involuntary nervous system. Okay. So the parts where you, it's just your reaction to things, it's not things, something that you're deliberately controlling per se, although I suppose you could. And this is then based on the idea that those experiences that you have that we've already talked a lot about are based in fear, okay? And specifically, it is when you ask the relevant question of someone who is then going to be in a position to have to lie, that there is some fear of those questions that they are going to have to lie about. Yeah, it's a very big assumption there, right? Right. So in the case of the story we started with, if there was this guy who was a leading suspect in a murder case, and they set him down, and um, they're going to ask him, did you murder, I don't know what her name was, uh, I want to call her... Jessica. Okay. <laughs> Did you murder Jessica? And that question in and of itself is supposed to create this fear that is then going to show this increased heart rate if he has to lie about it and, and blood pressure and all that. All right. So let's dive into exactly how this works. Yeah. So the process of how they go about actually implementing the quote unquote lie detection. So there's two types of questions, right? There's relevant and control questions. Yeah. Describe control questions first. What are those looking like? So the control questions are questions that you shouldn't have any reason to be concerned about. And the purpose of these is really to get a sort of baseline in terms of what your physiological arousal is like. So it'll be things like, is your name Ryan? And I would answer in strictly yes, no is what we found. Correct? Oh yeah. Thank you for yeah, clarifying so, that. Yeah. So I would say no. Okay. <laughs> I'm kidding. So is my name Ryan? Yes. Okay. Do you live at, I don't know what your address is. Do you live in Reno? Yes. Okay. And so these are questions that are very simple. They're straightforward and that we can get, you know, because everybody's going to be at a slightly different level in terms of what their baseline blood pressure and heart rate and skin galvanization is. That way that we can see where there start to be deviations from that. If the person who's administering this test is concerned that you're lying, then they're going to be specifically looking for those deviations. Okay, so that's our control questions. Now, our relevant questions actually pertain to the issue at hand, right? Right. So there's some sort of event that happens when your story, um, the murder of Jessica, would be where the relevant questions are coming from, correct? Yeah, exactly. And so those are questions, they're usually very straightforward. Did you murder her? Were you in the apartment at this time? That sort of thing. The questions that I just gave examples of are extremely specific. These are often, well, at least sometimes I saw it very broad. So the question might be something like, have you ever betrayed someone who trusted you at any point in your life? Yeah, I saw that as well. Yeah. And so that's a question where you might have to say yes. I saw some also like they put in a time frame. So like, have you ever stole anything after the age of 25? Oh, okay. You know, 
Interesting. Yeah. So it still could be pretty general. And then what do you mean by still? I've stolen people's time. <laughs> you know, stolen people's hearts. <laughs> Are these ads lying to you? Probably. Let's find out. <laughs> All right, we're back. So yeah, so we have the relevant questions, um, and they compare these relevant to the control questions across all those different measures, right. is my understanding. Yep. What else I kind of found was it's roughly five to six minutes long on average, although there's these like horror stories of them lasting forever and ever and ever. So they're kind of short-ish. But the majority of people that experience them up front for like the NSA or something like that report like that they hear all these things of how horrible they are, but they go through and they're just like, oh, it was really quick, it was easy, it was really short. I've heard that on average there's a few different three to six charts, it sounds like, that are that are looked at, and they do not give the final results while you're in the office, although most can seem to agree that if the, the easiest way to detect if you may have not passed is if they start asking more questions in the moment, you know? Oh, the person who's administering it is yeah, asking more questions? Yeah, oh, the yikes. calligrapher might start asking more questions on a certain topic, and that might be a consistent way to identify if you may have not past one of those questions. You know, I didn't actually think about the idea that the person who's administering a polygraph would be called a polygrapher. Yeah. That's funny. On top of that, they also have yes, no as their answers. It looks like it's really strict yes, no's. I would assume that's supposed to be a control as well on this. It would make sense. You try to like limit those things, but I don't know. Yeah. I didn't actually find why they would be yes, no questions. I was wondering if maybe it is that it's the immediate response and they're trying to look for like, what are the changes right when that response occurs? And so if they launch in this big, long story, then it might be really difficult to detect whether or not there is deception in there. Yeah. And we get into this, uh, they talk about sometimes it's more of an art or there's a bit of an art. So I wonder if that's intersecting here, but we'll get to that in a bit. That's always a sort of a red flag to me. Yeah. So to kind of get back to it, they give the final, they don't give the final results in the moment. They like to give it to someone. I, heard with a quote unbiased eye okay. i don't really know what an unbiased eye is yeah i was just going to ask you what what does that mean so presumably they, they have to give it to someone who has read a polygraph before but maybe just someone who wasn't present during that particular polygraph test you think yeah it okay. sounds like it okay so i kind of like the control of that but yeah you know like the that process but still like an unbiased eye yeah are we all really unbiased at the end of the day i think we'd argue, <laughs> argue no so you're saying that Basically, a lot of people have a lot of different biases, and we may or may not know that they're there. Yeah, I mean, we, we really don't know that. There is some research on those sort of things. Yeah. And there's still a lot to be done in that area. Yes, there is. So sometimes it sounds like they give an opportunity to resolve an issue if it comes up. So if there's some sort of weird spike or something, they'll ask a little bit more. Now, this is where it gets a little wishy-washy. Like when I was looking around the internet, you find those old websites that just aren't like really up to date and they're clearly biased mm-hmm. towards something. So a lot of people scream like, this is where interrogation happens. I don't know the extent to which interrogation happens in these, you know, and it's like those movie scenes where you like slide up and you're like, it's all super intense and they're in there for hours and they're asking all these questions about, you know, like in a very interrogative way. Right. That actually raises the point that I didn't bring up before, which is that where this is primarily used is has to do with crimes of some nature. Mm -hmm. There are some other places where it has been used in the past, but is not used any longer, I'll get to. But for the most part, this has been used when someone is presumed to have done something wrong. They are suspected of some wrongdoing or committing some crime or some terrorist act. So it could actually be used for people who are being held for interrogation for really serious offenses. And it could be used for people who, for which they're sort of minor defenses or for even something that's not an offense at all, which I'll get to in just a little bit. So I've heard that that sometimes they do a practice test to help people get used to the test. Interesting. I don't know. Again, like this is that stuff where it's like, it's hearsay. Like I'm pulling these off of websites. I'm seeing it consistent across websites and videos, videos, both kind of like produced by larger organizations that seem pretty solid as well as like those weird little clips of someone clearly just like has it out for (laughs) this, uh, a polygrapher or something like that. That's going on. But that's kind of interesting that they would have the opportunity to practice because it seems like that would potentially lead to more sort of false positives, detecting lies where there aren't actually lies yeah. or getting people maybe ready for where they 
are so ready to take the test that they're going to be better at lying and able to trick it later down the road. I don't know. That just seems like yeah. well, maybe they're maybe the practice test is specifically to throw them off so that it's easier to detect it. I don't know. Yeah. And that's it. Like there's, there's all those questions that come up yeah. and antipolygraph.org was one of the areas where they were talking about this, but it's strictly in a forum. Um, and they're linking to some things, but it's not like research like we like on the show. So yeah. They essentially then start asking questions, looking for sudden changes in the measures that are supposedly indicative of falsehood. Now, there were some assumptions that I ran into, and these are just kind of like, it seems people are assuming these things consistently yeah. in this setting. First, they assume that their baseline's accurate, and those measures are accurate. Right. And one thing that kind of popped up here was one person said like, oh, it takes more energy to lie through, a, through brain scan research. We know this. That reminds me of... This idea, um, if you, in the show, the U.S. version of The Office, Dwight goes to do a polygraph or a lie detector test on Jim, but he doesn't actually have a polygraph. So what he does is takes him down to a pharmacy and puts his arm in a blood pressure cuff and starts asking him these questions. And at the end, he said, you know, his blood pressure was high the entire time. And so he's like, he lied about everything, even his name. So (laughs) he didn't have a baseline comparison, but it was funny that because he had seen an increased blood pressure during that, that in that particular instance, someone who was a polygrapher would have assumed that that baseline was accurate. And so that makes me wonder about people who already have like sort of heavy breathing and high blood pressure. If they, if their baseline is going to be so high that detections increases of that would actually be a little bit difficult to measure because they'd be so high in the first place. Yeah. And the fact that they're kind of like this one gentleman was like resting on the brain scan research Mm -hmm. as to like why some of these assumptions are okay. made me a little bit nervous, especially after what we did on looking at the evidence of those sort of things. I think in like episode six or so when we kind of dove in the fMRI and such. Well, there was a whole book called Brainwashed, The Seductive Appeal of Mindless Neuroscience. And there was a, a significant portion of that book was dedicated to the problems with trying to use brain scans to do like lie detection sort of stuff. Because based on the conclusions of that book, they were arguing that we as a society and um, in the science community are nowhere near where the research needs to be in order for this to be a potentially viable situation, like even less accurate than just measuring physiological responses because lying is not just one place in the brain where things happen. It's very complicated. And as you said, it it depends on sort of your relationship with the lie and whether or not you're sort of trying to hide the truth. And there's a lot of things that go into when a lie takes place, but it's a really good book. I'd recommend checking it out. Brainwashed. I believe the authors are Sally Satal and uh, Scott O. Lillianfeld. Okay, cool. Yeah, I've not read that. Sounds very interesting and relevant. It's, it's actually a really interesting book to read. And because they did so much on this whole idea of using brain scans to do like lie detection stuff and how difficult those are to use and how unreliable they are, really, it's, uh, I think it's a good source for people who are interested in exploring this issue a little bit more. Cool. All right. So another thing I found is there are some folks that are saying that there's kind of this correlation of the bigger the issue, the bigger the lie, the bigger the reaction is how it works. So this is one of those assumptions? Yeah. And I don't know if we can assume that, especially since there's some evidence of people being able to kind of get around these sort of tests when they have committed the crime or at least been proved guilty through other means, such as like DNA and such. So presumably in this one, the implication is that people who are lying about something really important are very likely to be caught in that lie. Mm -hmm. People who are lying something about maybe something not so important are maybe less likely to be caught. But I think that the evidence is not necessarily in support of that. Yeah. And that's something we should be able to start to throw some numbers at, I guess. We don't need to be using these words like bigger. Yeah. Right. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Although it was, I, I guess, I mean, if they're using that for the sake of just kind of this PSA around it, then maybe that's why they did that. But yeah, I would expect some numbers at some point. So in addition to those, there's one gentleman, and I'm kind of paraphrasing here, said sometimes it's something that they have to look at closer. Like if someone answers one of those relevant questions in a little bit of a funny way and they see a spike on any of these measures, and sometimes it's super clear. Now, that's where it was followed with, these things are based in science, but sometimes there's an art that goes into it. Right. And that always raises red flags for me. And they go on to indicate like that the questions and the order matter. They don't Hmm. know how they matter. Who Um, who thought? (laughs) Yeah. 
but this there's a lot of people who looked into this. One that I hold on to tightly was a, a guy named Gold Diamond that essentially was just looking at surveys and the order in which you ask things. And he showed that you can stack it up to show an effect um, yeah. if you want to show an effect, or you can order them around and show that there's no effect. Yeah, so basically that you can sort of get the outcome you want if you order the questions in a certain way. Yep. Yeah. And his was survey work, so I will say it was different than the, the type of work that they're doing here. But the fact that we have seen that consistently applied in one domain means that we should definitely look at it in here, especially if the main people that are doing these sort of things kind of have this gut reaction of like, this stuff matters. Probably yeah. does. Yeah, I think that even if it's a little bit different, it's at least worth being aware of. You know, that that yeah. could be a thing. And it's similar enough in that you are uh, trying to get information from somebody. I think that that sort of context is similar, such that it just needs to be considered how that order might play a part and use some of the research and related fields to guide the work on that. Now, the last area of ass kind of assumptions that I found was that, so there's various different countermeasures that people can do. And they can, it sounds like they, they know what these are, right? I mean, I would expect they can kind of predict some of these, but they can also identify some of them through the spikes that they produce. Mm -hmm. So different countermeasures that have been used apparently are counting numbers backwards in your head can help counter something when you're lying. Okay. Sounds like. So it's like you're concentrating on something else. So you are not so distracted by the the lie or the question that's relevant. Yeah. <laughs> now, another one, squeezing of the buttocks, apparently, will produce an effect. Placing your toes, your feet more heavily into the ground can do that, as will produce some sort of effect. Holding your breath, altering your breath pattern, biting lips and gums can help to deceive, I guess, as well, and cause different blips in the graph. And they say it's difficult to do these things effectively. Okay. But I would say it's not impossible. Right. Yeah. It seems that this is something totally under the realm of this area of human behavior that we like to talk about that could be controlled for. Right. Yeah. Or learned or practiced and adapted upon and you could get better at it. Well, it makes me think about going back to the idea of the control questions and how some of these other mental and physical I guess, events might take place. Thinking about even if you ask someone something simple like, is your name X? And then maybe you have a reaction to that because you share the same name with your father or your mother or something, and you have a strained relationship with them. And so like immediately there's some anxiety produced because you're thinking, yes, that's my name. I hate my name, that sort of thing. But immediately there's this you know physical reaction so that your baseline level is so high because you have all these reactions to what are supposed to be control questions that then, again, going back to that idea of someone who comes in already having high blood pressure, the changes that might occur relative to those control questions might be so small that they'd be missed and just undetected. And, you know, I guess someone could also do that intentionally, you know, try and make themselves think of something that causes that during those baseline control questions. Although I think they try and sort of pepper them in. So it's like control and relevant questions a little yeah. bit that I'm not sure about in terms of the process, but I think that's how it's supposed to work. That's what I've found as well. Okay, yeah. great. All of these things could either be strategies or something that someone does on accident. You know, you might sit, be sitting there and just be in the situation where someone's asking you these questions. Maybe you're a fidgety person and you put your toes on the ground and you kind of put yourself on the edge of your chair, or, you know they might even advise you to, to try and sit comfortably, but you still have some of these immediate reactions to the particular situation of being interrogated with a, you know, a bunch of stuff hooked up to your body. Exactly. And that's what I want to bring up. They are assuming that these things are being done because someone is lying. Right. And we can assume that, I think. Yes. So a good example and way for us to kind of transition, I think would be there is a particular National Geographic YouTube video called Beating a Lie Detector Test. I didn't know that. It was obviously part of this larger series and they were just kind of doing more of this kind of like PSA on like, you know, like they do, like helping people help. They're, they're creating content to help people learn more about things that are happening in the world. Right? right. So I'm not dogging on them per se. They essentially set up to where one of the guys, the host, he's presumably dropped a game console. So he's brought in. You mean like physically dropped it and Dropped broke a it? game console, okay. broke it. And they're going to bring him in for a, poly a polygraph test and he needs to, <laughs> okay. he needs to try to counter it and see if he can like pass it. So he did a couple things. He tried putting a pin in his shoe so he could step on it and increase stress prior to all this happening, like during his control questions. Oh, it's related to what I said earlier. Yes. And then he tried putting antiperspirant on his fingers. Now, apparently the antiperspirant increases conductivity. 
<laughs> I don't know the extent to which it does. And the pin in issue created a different type of spike they reported. Okay. So obviously, I guess if you're, there's a couple angles on this. If, like, if you're looking at this as like evidence, it's not, and they are, I think would say, yes, this is not evidence for, you know, it's not research that they're doing here. Right. At all. Just sort of a demonstration. Yeah. And we can't look at those sort of things, but it was also co- just completely fabricated, you know? Right. Like, I can't, there's, there's so many errors in this that, about all it is is this kind of PSA sort of thing. So was he able to pass the lie detector? No, he did not pass the lie detector test okay. because they identified apparently different types of spikes during that. But for me, like them fabricating the lie in the first place makes it something hard to even look at the results. Right. That's not a, not a super well controlled experiment. So while this ad break plays, don't listen to it. Go listen to the band lies instead. And we're back. So what are some of the different data or research articles or evidence that you found looking at this? So those who are really for the polygraph test, so they're in favor of it, they promote it. These tend to be the people who do the work. They are polygraphers, but there are others as well in law enforcement and whatnot. But those who do it, they seem to really believe in it completely. They firmly believe in this process as being effective. They even started their own journal called Polygraph, which is appropriately named. And they claim 95% accuracy. And I'm just looking at that number thinking, oh my God, like law enforcement's job is over. You know, they they don't have to worry about this anymore because they've got this amazing tool that's 95% accurate. Correct me if I'm wrong. It's still not a, like allowed in a court of law, right? Anywhere? In some of them. Yeah. I'm going to get to that in just okay. a moment. Yeah. There are some that do still allow that. Really? Yeah. Okay. But they do also claim that there is a nearly 100% chance of being cleared if you're telling the truth and a 95% chance of being detected if you're telling a lie. So those are fabulous numbers. Yeah. If that was accurate, then I think that this should, you know, this could be used in basically every setting for which it's reasonable to try and do some kind of lie detection. Now, those who are not for the polygraph are not just out there being naysayers like we just wanted to pick something to fight against and this is the thing that we landed on but these are people who also work in law enforcement and people who are scientists and psych- psychologists one of the things that they say against the polygraph is that the polygraph doesn't actually identify whether or not you're telling the truth or more importantly what the truth is it will only tell you if you're lying assuming that it's accurate in that so they might ask them if you have ever been to this one particular location and they say no, or they say yes, I don't know, whatever it is. And it turns out to be a lie. Well, that just tells you, you know, a little bit more information about that. It doesn't tell you any specific details, right? Or, you know, where a particular event took place. If it took place here, no. Did it take place here? No. Did it take place here? No. If any of those were true, for example, then we don't necessarily know where it it did take place. So, it's difficult in that all it really does is reveal whether or not there is a lie, assuming that it's accurate in doing that. Another one, and this is important because this goes to the major underlying premise of the polygraph, is that medical science has never found any measurable emotional response that could reliably be linked to lying. There just isn't one. So this idea that if you have elevated blood pressure or increased skin conductance of perspiration or any of those other measures that they are employing, that that means that someone is lying. There are lots of circumstances where we have those emotional responses and we can't necessarily link them to lying, even in this context in the medical science. Okay. And as a sort of thought experiment, this is something a little bit different. What is the lowest possible rate of accuracy on this? Because this is a yes-no measure, right? So they could either get a true or false, a dichotomous. So it's it's one or the other. What is the lowest possible accuracy that this could have? 50%. Yeah, because if it was lower than that, if it was reliably like 1%, then it would be so wildly inaccurate that you could actually use that to just flip it and say that that was, you know, it was accurate in the opposite direction. Yep. So like this one is, you know, 100% almost always, always detected that it was the truth when it was a lie. Then we look at that and say, okay, well now we just know that that means that when we see this thing that is 100% the truth, that means that they're lying because it's always that way. It's reliable. So you're setting this up perfectly. What's the research say? (laughs) So when people have done some of the really good controlled studies on this, they found about 67 
97% accuracy for the polygraph when detecting the lie. But what they did then is they continued to explore that. This was initially, right? So the polygraph came out. There's obviously a lot of people who had a lot of interest in really determining just how accurate this was. And so just out of curiosity, we followed the scientific process and discovered 67% accuracy. That's not great. A little lower than 95%, but it's still better than half. Okay. Yeah. And so then when that they continued to do more research, they got better controls. They got more clever in how they arranged those variables. So it was really detecting whether or not it was accurate, got it down to 52% accuracy. This is literally as inaccurate as it could possibly be without it actually being informative in the opposite direction. Right. So that's not good. <laughs> yeah. You know, at this point, it's a toss of a coin. You know, if someone was lying or telling the truth, you could flip a coin and it would be as accurate as this test is if you got, you know, heads or tails. Yeah. <laughs> and there was that way. one of the videos that I was sampling from was a guy who reportedly worked within some government agency and then transferred out across 20, 30 years. It sounds like he worked there for 20-ish years. Mm -hmm. And this thing was he was starting to teach people and show that you can actually beat these sort of things. Caused yeah. a lot of problems. He was actually being sentenced. I don't know where that ended up at. Yeah, um, there, there was a guy of, who went to prison for teaching people how to pass. It might be the same guy. That, sounds like it. Um, yeah. But his his thing, he was a little bold about it. It was just, you know, you, you, you grab a quarter and you flip it, heads, you're telling the truth, tails, you're lying. <laughs> and that's how he opened it and just saying, like, that's where the research is at. So yeah, I definitely saw that as well. So another argument that those who are against the polygraph use is that um, when someone who is, is a polygrapher who is administering this test, the more knowledge they have about the circumstances for the case, the better they are at conducting and evaluating the polygraph. But that's actually kind of true of anyone who would be doing any type of t interrogation. So any cop who knows a lot about the case, who knows a lot about the information can go in and just have a regular conversation with someone and be about as good at, you know, arranging it so that they tell the truth or that they get more details or that they're able to sort of detect when they're lying a little bit. And that just comes from general training um, on how to do sort of good police work and good detective work, I guess. Another argument against, there are quite a few of them, is this fact that when you're engaging in deception, this is a verbal and cognitive task, okay? But there is no direct measure of these sort of verbal cognitive tasks where it's just your own sort of self-expression. And so when you're trying to measure something like someone's physiology, that is not a measure of those, those cognitive processes, that sort of um, language element of this right and the language itself doesn't necessarily help because that's what you're trying to detect yeah <laughs> and so uh it's sort of a mismatch between what your measurement system is and the thing that you're actually trying to measure okay now i'm not sure how much i agree with this as its own but another one that they they cite is that there's not very much training required to administer a polygraph i saw i think it was like six weeks maybe of polygraph testing i saw one that said 14 weeks okay so it's probably a range depending on where you're at and I didn't dive into it. And we know from learning, right, that there's so many multitudes of or different variables that go into learning quickly or not. And right. all that, that I'm not going to, yeah, like we wouldn't slam necessarily on the length of time. Yeah. It's, you know, for safe, it's, are you being trained to confidence in these sort of things? And that was exactly my thought on this, um, was this fact that, you know, if, if you have a really, really well structured curriculum around this then you might be able to more effectively teach someone how to use this in one day than someone who has really poor curriculum can in six months. And so the length of time doesn't tell me a lot about it. It really would be whether or not they demonstrate some level, as you said, of, of competency with this. The last one is the story. There was apparently the spy. He was an international spy, and he was able to pass five polygraphs. Like That seems like a lot to me. But he passed all five of them about his activities as a spy. And this is also interesting because this goes back to this idea that we had discussed previously about sort of the bigger the lie, the bigger the circumstances, the bigger the event. Well, this is a guy lying about essentially like international espionage and potentially terrorism and weapons and all that sort of thing. So these were in what I would think to be really big lies, but he was able to pass all five of them. And then he, would, he described just how easy it was. That it was, you know, very low effort for him. After he was caught later with actual evidence and circumstances, he said, polygraph tests are, quote, junk science, a superstition and a refuge from responsibility. So, <laughs> strong words. Very strong words. But, you know, he, he's kind of, it's coming straight from the horse's mouth in this case because he's the one who knows how they work enough that he can beat them with ease and did it multiple times. Five times. That's so many. Okay.
There's some other considerations about uh, using the polygraph test as a lie detection system and whether or not that is a reliable way of detecting lies. And one of those is that when you're in these sort of high intensity contexts and situations where you are being scrutinized and questioned and interrogated by some authority figure in a you know dark room or some uncomfortable place, and it's about these extremely sensitive topics that's enough to put anyone on edge and on high alert. You know, this implies that there's likely to be sort of a high number of false positives because people are just reacting to things in general. And if you're already anticipating one of those relevant questions, whether or not it's something that you are going to be lying about, like these are, it's really sensitive. So if I were to just ask you just sitting here, did you kill Jessica? Obviously you didn't, but like in an interrogation setting, that might might be enough to set you off because like, whoa, like that's a really intense question to be asked. Yeah. And so the experience that you have just being in that context is likely to have the kind of arousal that might lead to the detection of a lie where one didn't actually occur. Like surveys have shown that many, many people in sort of the lay public really believe that this is a legitimate way of testing for and detecting falsehoods and people who are who are lying in these circumstances and for law enforcement. Yeah, I mean, it seems likely that if you you know start to get some more direct measures around something, um, right. Especially if you don't have a lot of experience looking at the the likelihood that those actually really measure what we think they're measuring, it looks like it's a lot better of a measurement system, right? I completely agree. I was looking at this thinking it kind of makes sense when you had absolutely nothing before for someone to come in and say, wait, let's, let's look at some objective measures. We can directly measure things like your breathing and your blood pressure and your heart rate. And so all they had to do was then make a huge leap in assumptions (laughs) that those things were uh, indicative of lies. Now they're, they're great equipment maybe for medical testing, but maybe not so much for lies, but yeah, a lot of people really believe in them and they, they do overcome that obstacle of really, subjective interpretation to more objective measures. The problem is those objective measures aren't measuring lies. Another consideration in here, and this goes back to that guy, is that a single failure of a lie detection test, even of the smallest thing, well, maybe not the smallest, but you know, of something that's even a little bit relevant for someone can completely ruin someone's life. And it's really this catch 22, because if you refuse to take the test, then it looks like you're guilty. So imagine you're in this situation where you go into a, you know, a place where you have to get a lie detection test. You already know from the research that there's a high probability that there's going to be a false positive. It's going to be assumed that you're lying even when you're not, especially because it's those high intensity circumstances. Mm -hmm. And so you might want to refuse, but then you know, if you refuse, that looks like an admission of guilt. So then you take the test, but then it pegs you as being a liar anyway, because those false positives, like that sucks. (laughs) You're so stuck in that situation. What do you do? And there's a lot of problems around this with employment screening. This is no longer allowed at all to be used in employment screening And actually, the law specifically states, not only can they not use a polygraph when they're hiring people, but they cannot go back and look at an old polygraph that they may have taken in the hiring process, because they might be just looking for whether or not they're lying or telling the truth. And there's so many problems with this that you just can't use it. There's a lot of false positives. It's not reliable. And it's kind of an invasion of someone's privacy as well. They also might end up learning information that isn't relevant to the performance at work that is very personal to that person. It'd almost be like looking at their medical records before you hire someone. That's also, you know, not something you can do because that's personal information. But what's interesting about that is that you can still use a polygraph test for security positions, even for the FBI, CIA, and NSA, which is weird because it's the government who put that restriction in place in the first place. So... I don't know. Yeah, there's a degree to which they're still believed to be effective, right? Yeah. Or worthwhile in those processes. Yeah. It's cool. I'm not in those. I respect it at this level, you know? Sure. And I, I get it. Maybe we'll see someday if I'm ever working there. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. <laughs> I can't see that happening, but it's possible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, one thing that's interesting that's a consideration around the use of the polygraph is that as many as 25 to 50% of people who are actually guilty and go in for a polygraph test may still confess their guilt because of the circumstance where they believe in the polygraph, where they feel like it's, they're going to be found out anyway. I wonder if that's why it's still used. That could be. But the question that I ask is like, okay, so is it worth it to have up to 75% of people, you know, because we're talking about 20, 25, 50. So between 75 and 50% of people who might be innocent, be imprisoned or possibly sentenced to death based on this technology, you know, is it okay if out of a hundred people, 
50 of them admitted their guilt, 50 of them didn't, but all 100 of them were killed because 50 of them were innocent, you know? Like, is that okay? I think no. I, I would have a really hard time being okay with, as like, if I were someone who was put on death row for something I didn't do because I failed a polygraph test because the technology's not that good. Yeah. And then later they're like, whoops, sorry about that. Yeah. I would say, I would say no upfront as well. I would love to be able to see a lot more of a history and the data on these sort of things. Like I can't imagine what, you know, entities like FBI, CIA, and NSA have um, when it comes to data on this. Everything's been recorded. Like yeah. that's like every polygraph is supposed to be recorded. Right. Right. Very true. I mean, the amount of just information data that you could actually look at, like maybe there's other things back there to learn. And I'd like to learn those someday. <laughs> yeah, sure. All right. So as we had mentioned previously, it's inadmissible in most courts in most states in the country. There are 19 states that still use polygraphs, including Nevada, where we're at. Interesting. But in four of those states, both parties on both the um, defense and the prosecution must agree to take the polygraph test. You know, you might put that down to 15 because there's probably going to be a lot of people who say no. But, you know, between, we'll say 15 and 19 states, it is admissible in court. But there are 19 states where it is still admissible. Well, you can practice your line. And to do that, let's listen to some liars. Here are some ads. All right, let's get back to this conversation. Okay. And then the last thing I had on this in terms of considerations about about the polygraph is that there are ways of sort of hiding the truth without necessarily telling a lie. And we talked about that, I think, in the truth and lie episodes that we did. But it's just worth considering you can be really vague and not necessarily be telling a lie. Yeah, just like you can ask really vague questions and get these convoluted answers. Right. right. <laughs> because although they're supposed to say yes, no questions, they might say like, well, no, not really, but kind of. <laughs> or, you know, and then they'll ask probing questions and it just gets them off on us sort of tangent where they're on irrelevant things that it's really easy to tell the truth about something like that. All right. So let's wrap up some take homes here. Okay. So as we sort of said, this tool, this polygraph test is less useful than just guessing with a little bit of evidence. I mean, if someone had some of the circumstances, they would be better at detecting the real information and getting information from someone in an interrogation than trying to use a polygraph test. Yeah. And even worse, you mentioned this in a, you know, a few different ways, but it can straight up just ruin somebody's life. Right. Yeah. Someone who's innocent, if they fail a polygraph test, this can be completely damning to the rest of their life because of the stigma and how many people believe in this. So where does that leave you, Abraham? <laughs> My opinion about this, and I feel like I have, I've tried to not be too strong about this throughout, but I think, you know, having done the research on this and, and understanding this topic pretty well, I really think that this is technology that just has to be abandoned. I, I think it's, it's too dangerous in terms of getting things wrong and ruining people's lives. And I think that it's, it's at best kind of a waste of time that is occasionally scares people into admitting their guilt. I mean, that's a best case scenario. That's not, uh, I think a great method. Yeah. It's yeah. That's not a great outcome for it either. And at the worst, it can destroy the lives of innocent people. And I mean, quite literally for those who are put to death for crimes they didn't commit. And it can do this on a pretty massive scale because every you know life that affects, there's a, a network of people whose lives it will also affect. I would agree with you on that up front. And then I'd just say like, if there's a way that we could safely and like actually research this more to mm -hmm. figure out what it is, or maybe study those archives of, you know, somewhere like the FBI, like if they ever release all that information someday, that would be cool. I agree. It would be cool to like relook at this and understand it more from the scientific perspective, the ethical side. I agree with you there. And I mean, there is sort of a bigger conversation here to have about that. We're not going to try and incorporate into this discussion, but this, the fact that, a lot of people get really satisfied with just identifying guilt. You know, this, oh, we figured out that you were lying. <sighs> okay, we can all go to bed now. And not so much of the asking the question, why did this happen? And how can we stop it from ever happening again? It's not necessarily as important about telling whether or not they lied, although there might be really important information to get out of that person. And I don't want to discount how critical that can be. But it's it can be one of those stopgap measures where people get so satisfied with having detected the truth that they are no longer interested in what caused the problem in the first place. And if we can figure out if there's a systemic issue that is causing these types of crimes and problems, like, let's get rid of that. And then if there's still problems, then we can go at this other way. But, you know, I think the prevention angle is, is sort of where I land on that. I love it. Cool. All right, so that was our episode on polygraphs. Now, let's 
Let's dive into some of the stuff that we either didn't cover in that discussion or has happened since then. And the first thing I'm going to do is what I don't think that we talked about last time, which was that there is actually two different types of tests that are used in, when conducting a polygraph. The first one is called the comparative question test or CQT. And that's really the most common method. That's how most people are doing the, the polygraph. If you imagine the polygraph test being implemented, that's probably what you're picturing. And this is the relying on physiological measures such as blood pressure, breathing, and skin conductivity, also called a dermal response, while asking relevant questions and control questions about some case. Right. It, that's probably the example that you see portrayed in literally any form of media. Right. Now, alternatively, the concealed information test, or the CIT, looks for physiological changes when presented with statements of information. That is, does someone have a stronger reaction to questions that are pertinent to the investigation? And this is, of course, not better than CQT and could arguably be worse because it is now not even trying to compare a verbal response to a physiological one, but just assume that any physiological response means something or maybe is better by unburdening the response from the physiological constraints. Uh, they both aren't great. I don't really, I mean, they both sound terrible. They sound like they don't work very well. Yeah. And actually like they don't, they are not completely separate. Uh, it's actually fairly common to, if you're going to do the concealed information test or the CIT, you'll just do it after you've already done the comparative question test. So you can do them both in the same interview. Sure. But yeah, just the consideration of like either you're, you're making a statement and then trying to measure the reaction physiologically and then infer meaning from that reaction, or you're asking them a question, waiting for their answer and comparing their answer against their physiological reaction and assuming that that means something. And right. so one of the things that we talked about in the previous episode that you will have heard is that really the worst that you can do on this is 50%, about 50% wrong, right? Because if you get right. more wrong than 50% wrong, then it's actually predictive in the in the opposite direction, meaning if you were getting things that were being registered a lot as lies so consistently that like they were it was like less than 50% of the time, then you could actually reliably predict that what you were measuring as lies were actually the truth and infer that things that were then measuring as truth were being a lie. You could just simply switch the script. So 50% is as wrong as this could possibly be, really. <laughs> right. Of course, people have tried to combine polygraph tests with fMRIs. We've done an episode on fMRIs and other brain scan techniques. Go back and check those out if you want like a fine-grained analysis of what an fMRI is actually measuring, because... Short answer is, is it's not your actual brain activity. <laughs> right, right, right. Something important to know there. Also, it's measuring it at a very zoomed out le level relative to what your neurons are actually doing. Anyway, besides the relative accuracy of fMRIs, and they have been an absolute godsend for medical research, but in terms of like understanding psychological phenomenon, I think that for a lot of people, they've been a huge distraction. And so trying to combine them with polygraph tests is actually extremely dangerous for a couple of reasons. One, fMRIs do not show what someone is thinking. Imagine I said that in all caps, because <laughs> that is how I wrote yes, it. Because that's how he wrote it. They do not show what someone is thinking. They don't even show a vague approximation of what someone is thinking. At best, and I mean this with like heavy grain of salt, at best what they measure is that part of the brain that is regulating the physiological responses that are already being measured by the polygraph test are sort of correlated there, and B, that th there's another reason that's dangerous. So I said one and B, one and two, A and B, you know what I mean? Hey, listen, it's one of those days. It's one of those days. Two, people are so enamored with this quote-unquote wonder machine of the fMRI that they may inadvertently conclude that its findings are more robust in support of the lie detection when in fact all they're measuring is the exact same phenomenon as the polygraph just where it's taking place in the brain instead of inside your body. Because if your lungs are doing something, if your skin is conducting something, if your blood pressure is doing something, that's all shit that's being regulated by your brain anyway, right? And so if right. you're measuring it in your brain and on your body, you're getting the exact same measurement. You're just measuring it in two different places. Right. And so that's, again, at best, assuming that you can correlate those things. So I think there's a real concern here that it lends credence to this idea of the polygraph when it really doesn't do anything different and is arguably much more dangerous because people assume that it does do something that it does not do. Absolutely. Now, let's get into the research part of this, because this is some of my favorite stuff. 
Now, a right. 2018 study in the Journal of Applied Research in Memory and Cognition summarized their paper by saying that, quote, while some evidence supports the use of lie detection tests in specific contexts, the overall accuracy of these tests remains questionable, end quote. And while that is only one study that talks about this idea that the results could be questionable, it's worth bringing a second study. So a 2019 study in federal practice found several medical conditions that can further hamper the use of polygraph of the polygraph test and as such counter recommend the use of polygraph for interrogations. That's two studies that say "Eh, it's probably not as good as you think it is. Probably shouldn't do it. Yes, there was a 2020 white paper by Michelle Vittorio at the University of New Haven that seemed relatively keen on finding the silver lining of the polygraph. It really looked like they wanted to try and pull out what meaning they could and eventually reported that, quote, according to the evidence and research reviewed, it appears appropriate to exclude currently available polygraph testing procedures from pre-employment screening and background investigations in both private and government organizations, and to confirm the non-admissibility of polygraph examinations in criminal courts, end quote. Although it was written more elegantly than I said it, the sentiment there being like, this is still something that should not be used. Yes. Then following that, a 2021 paper by Katsoglu, 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 I, I think, in the International Journal of Evidence and Proof. I love that that title for a journal. The International Journal right. of Evidence and Proof. The article was called, quote, Zombie Forensics, the Use of the Polygraph and the Integrity of the Criminal Justice System in England and Wales. And it further concluded that the polygraphs are not only contraindicated by the evidence, but that they are contradictory and quote detrimental to the integrity of the legal order it's pretty damning <laughs> yeah they they were uh, <laughs> yeah <laughs> they were not soft about that nope some other things I don't recall if we reported in the original one, because although there has been those re- those recent studies since we originally published this article, there's not actually been a ton of updates on this. Most people kind of gave up on it 20 years ago and has sort of just stayed at that place, although the American Polygraph Association very confusingly calling itself the APA, has tried to continue to push the narrative that polygraphs are useful. The Department of Defense has found that the polygraph to be only slightly better than chance, and so they don't tend to recommend using it. The National Academy of Sciences concluded that there is little evidence that the polygraph is anywhere near as accurate as the American Polygraph Association claims that it is. So we've got sort of multiple organizations, even ones that would have a vested interest in using this tool, coming out saying, we're not really sure this is worth really using. Yeah, it sounds like these folks are hanging out with the facilitated communication people. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> ooh. <laughs> so, what evidence suggests that the polygraph is accurate seems to rely on whether the polygraph was conclusive or inconclusive, not whether it was actually accurate in detecting deception. Articles in favor of polygraphs are pretty much always, always as far as we could find, conducted by polygraph advocates. Other evidence cited questioning actual criminals, although those experiments seem to indicate that the person administering the polygraph already knew the truth. Others have used hypothetical scenarios where people are told to pretend that they are co- that they committed a crime and then try to lie about it to the polygraph, which introduces the problems of one, the tester knows the information already, and two, the people aren't actually lying, nor did they actually commit a crime. So talk about measuring a nothing burger using unicorn farts. Essentially what's happening here. Yeah. And you can't see me, but I'm doing a rainbow, a rainbow (laughs) sign. Ah, rainbow farts. We gesticulate on these videos, which you can find out more about if you join us on Patreon. Yes, that's (laughs) true. Watch watch the video. (laughs) Just for the gestures. That's really, you come for the content, you stay for the gestures. That's it. So, I mean, really, if I had the thought as I was reading through this recent research here is that the polygraphs have a a surprising amount in common with dowsing rods. Also a topic Mm -hmm. we should probably cover at some point, which is to say that they don't work in the way that they say that they work. And when they do work, it's kind of either due to luck or because your observer was so skilled that they did all of the actual work and the machine is just kind of pretense. And like I said, we'll have to cover dowsing routes at some point. But I think what happens is you have some people who are, get really good at they start to pick up on subtle cues from people when they're being deceitful and they get better at then chance at detecting when people are lying because they, they just get really good practice with it. And sure. that the machine there is just kind of a gimmick, right? That's sort of like, yeah, I'll use this thing. So it looks like I'm doing something sciencey as I'm actually reading this person's body language. And like people use like the Ekman's facial recognition thing we've talked 
talked about a long time ago when we talked about the five to one ratio. Anyway, like they'll get really good at reading people's sort of body language. And so then they use it. And the same thing is true with dowsing rods is like they might be picking up on some subtle cue in the environment that's completely unrelated to the fact that they're holding coat hangers in their hands. Right. But anyway, (laughs) so that seems to be the sort of key ingredient to the success of this if and if it ever works. Right. Like, first of all, it's inadmissible in many states in courts. And I think in federal court, it's also considered inadmissible because they're they're so easy to fool and because they don't detect what they say that they're detecting. So anyway, I think that's, uh, that's sort of what I have to say about my conclusion of, of, uh, dowsing rods and, uh, yeah, and you tests. nailed it. Thank you for joining us on this episode of dowsing rods. <laughs> no, it's just, it's just one of those things that like, it just doesn't work. And, and the fact that it persists is exhausting. It really is like, it's, it's, we need better stuff. You know, I think this is a tool that we have sunk way too much time and effort into when we could be doing something that works better. I don't know exactly what it is, but I think just stop wasting time on this one. Find something better. Right. And stop hurting people with it and stop hurting people with it. Yeah. Like it has been, it has been so much more a scourge than a benefit. Yes. Anyway, let's go ahead and make sure that we do our recognition, our due diligence here. We are going to recommend some things for you, and that's fun. And so uh, first, I want to tell you some people we need to thank. First, I'd like to thank my team. Justin Greenhouse does editing and production on these episodes, fact-checking and research and writing by Shane, Jess, and myself. Financial support comes from you, our listeners, and by the fact that we get advertising done and you guys help that mean something to the advertisers. So thank you. But major support support and kudos go to the people who have taken the extra leap. The ex- they've gone the extra mile and really helped us secure our mission. And that is Mike M, Megan, Layla, Mike T, Justin, Kim, Joshua, The Daily BA, Brad, Stephanie, Olivia, and Brian. Thank you all so much. You are the best and we so appreciate you and all that you do. Yes. Now, I'd also like to say if you'd like to support us in other ways, you can go over to our merch store and pick up sweaters, beanies, hats, jackets, water bottles, stickers, mugs, and all kinds of other goodies. So head over there if you want some sweet swag you can give away as a gift. Maybe replace your polygraph machine with one of those things and just throw the polygraph machine into the dump. Yes. Or, you know, responsibly recycle it in some way that you can. It's probably electronic. Recycling yeah, use it for parts. Yeah, that, that I think. And then also, I think you can leave us a rating and review, like and subscribe, tell a friend, go out and invent a new interview technique that's likely to detect deception called the why we do what we do technique. Yes. And those are all good ways you can support us. I like it. Anything I missed before we get to recommendations, Shane? Nope. I think that covers it. Recommendations. I am recommending... So this is a special interest group. This is the Behavior and Social Issues Journal housed under the BFSR, or Behaviorists for Social Responsibility. This is through the Applied Behavior Analysis Association International, and they they do all kinds of active things. Great group of people. Go check them out. Go join. Be a sustaining member. Help save the world. It's just it's a it's a cool group of people who are whose mission is to go out and help build sustainable practices and find ways to sort of disseminate that information and make it as cheap and affordable and easy for people to do. And um, and I, I'm you know I'm just happy to be a part of it. I'm glad that they're out there doing what they do. So consider go checking them out if you're interested in sustainability type issues. Yes, 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 yes. So my recommendation is music. If you like music, I like music. And and if you ever want to like reach out to us and talk about music, I am more than happy to talk about music. Both of us enjoy yeah. music quite a bit. Absolutely. And this is a band that I forgot existed for a while. And then they came back on my radar. And this is a band called Old Man Gloom. Yay. Specifically recommend an album called Meditations in B. This is a essentially kind of like a extreme metal super group from like members of cave in and converge and ISIS and all of those bands that came out in like the late nineties, early two thousands. They were all very heavy and kind of groundbreaking in the world of extreme music. So meditations and B is great. The Christmas record is really good. You can't really go wrong with anything, but start with meditations and B because that is a really great starting point for this band. Old man gloom. That's fun. Okay. I like that name. It's a great name for a band, right? <laughs> it really is. I really enjoy it. Yeah. I forgot to mention, I, was say, I don't usually do this, but as I was talking about BFSR, I forgot to mention, if you're a student, they actually have like some grant seed money they're trying to like give away to people who are interested in doing sustainability research. So that might be something to check out. They are trying to support uh, students doing some cool stuff. So uh, that might be a reason to check them out. Sorry, I didn't mean to I love undercut your, your recommendation there. but No, you're good. Please always do. <laughs> But I think that is all that I have for now. Thank you all so much for listening to us today. Anything else you'd like to add before we go, Shane? Not today. All right, then. This is Abraham. And this is Shane. We're out. See ya. 
You've been listening to Why We Do What We Do. You can learn more about this and other episodes by going to www.wwdpodcast.com. Thanks for listening, and we hope you have an awesome day. Thank you.